YouTube and welcome to South Africa. This is my second YouTube video. To anyone who watched my first YouTube video, I'd like to thank you very much. Especially Martin, who uh, was kind enough to link my video on his uh, YouTube channel. That was very generous and I got a good boost of views and comments and uh, generally people seem to like my first video. So I decided to make a second one. Now, this is a bank of supercapacitors. To be exact, they're Ioxus, I believe I'm saying that correctly, 2.7 volt, 350 farad supercapacitors, which is a fair amount of capacitance. Altogether in series, they wind up to 58 farads at 16 volts. Now, they were very simply wired together up with some lugs and some heavy gauge cable. I don't know if it's quite sufficient. My first design used pieces of aluminium, but I suspect it should work just fine hopefully. And uh, basically, I built this pack because there was a chap on YouTube and he built a very similar pack. I believe they used a different brand of capacitor, but he sh made a video and on it he could start a small 1.6 liter car. It's a decent sized car and I was quite impressed. So I figured, hell, I need one of those things. So I ordered myself these capacitors from the local electronics supply thing on the internet. And yes, we do have the internet, obviously, in South Africa, because this video comes through the internet. Ooh. Anyway, all joking aside, there are a few differences, however, to uh, Laser Saber's design. I did include some... Okay, basically, start off with this end. Across the inputs, or the outputs, depending on your point of view, uh, I put a Schottky diode. Basically, the, the only reason I put that diode there was just in case I plugged it up wrong. Because, well, I'm not the brightest fellow in the world, but anyway. So, uh, I simply put that there. What should happen, if I did plug this incorrectly into my little power supply, improvised, of course, um, the current would bypass the capacitors and flow directly through this as a dead short. That should give me enough time to turn off the whole thing before I cause any damage to the capacitors. The second reason is, I'm not exactly certain if this will work, is if this isn't a car or it will most likely be in a bike, if the charging circuitry from the bike should fail, and uh, there could be the potential, I guess, I'm not exactly certain, but there could be the potential for a small amount of reverse current to flow into this, uh, possibly damaging the capacitors. It might cause less damage in a lead-acid battery, but I'm not exactly certain how much uh, reverse current these things can take before being severely damaged. So what this should do should afford a bit of protection against that. It's not fail-proof or anything of the sort. I haven't tested it. I don't even know if it works. But uh, I'm optimistic, at least. It's better than nothing. And now the second thing I did that was different was I uh, used these 2.4 volt Zener diodes in reverse bias across each capacitor. Now most of the literature on the internet says the absolute best way to balance a uh, bank of supercapacitors is simply to increase their leakage current about tenfold by using uh, resistors rated at about 1%. And uh, basically, you just stick a resistor across each capacitor that increases their leakage by about tenfold. And uh, generally, that's enough to keep them all well within balance. I have tried this. I assembled some uh, 120 ohm resistors, I believe, uh, at 1%. And I basically uh, lugged them to uh, each capacitor. Charging and discharging, basically, they stayed absolutely perfectly balanced. Now there is a second option to balancing and that's by using active balancing and uh, that's far more complicated and requires a small PC board attached to the top of each capacitor that essentially shunts current once it reaches a predetermined point through a series of large power resistors. That's a great option but uh, the local electronic supply doesn't sell those only these capacitors. So what I did was, I did a bit of more. I did a bit more googling, and the, although it's quite limited, some people have used Zener diodes in reverse bias across capacitors to balance them. There's very little work done on it, but 
it has some uh, some flaws from what I gather, and I, I wouldn't be qualified to explain them to you. I suggest you just simply Google up the subject, uh, because I would flop it explaining it. But essentially, these block most of the current. There is a bit of leakage, but that's in the nanoamps range. But uh, it should block all the current at any voltage below 2.4. It's not exactly true because uh, these aren't exactly 100% accurate, let's say. They're actually pretty crap. They leak quite a bit of current at maybe 1.4 volts. No, they are even below 1.4 volts. Normally they should simply open up at exactly 2.4 volts. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean 1.4 volts. I mean they start leaking at about 2.2 volts, let's say and they really open up at a voltage of maybe 2.6 when they should be opening up at 2.4 but essentially what they do is when the voltage in the perfect world when voltage of each capacitor reaches a voltage above 2.4 volts current can flow through them exactly as they would through a resistor however the, the current only begins to flow through them at 2.4 volts not like a resistor where current would flow through them at basically anything above zero volts so they act somewhat like a more advanced balancing method it is flawed however you can't dissipate much current and in reverse bias these xenodiodes have a internal resistance of about a hundred ohms so that explains why they don't simply explode when they go above 2.4 volts basically short circuiting the capacitor and exploding but they have an internal resistance of 100 ohms, which is slightly, which dissipates more current than the 120 ohms resistors that would be recommended for this purpose. I have done a fair bit of testing, and it appears to work great. Uh, I had one of these inner diodes fail because uh, basically I threw it across the room by accident. Okay, that was pretty embarrassing, but anyway, uh, I installed it and it was broken basically, and. Uh, one of these middle capacitors was the one, and essentially uh, it kept on overcharging, nothing over its 2.7 volt limit. But uh, you could see that if you didn't have a, a xenodiode on, on one of the capacitors, it would overcharge, so it should be working just fine. So I'm quite happy with that. Now, will I be starting a car in this video? No, sadly I won't be, because... Uh, long day okay <laughs> uh, but uh, the idea is actually to start a bike so I was scrounging around in the equivalent of a garage and I found one moment this made in the USA 10 imaginary internet points if you know what this is okay you win it's a Harley Davidson battery or at least a lobotomized Harley Davidson battery. I sliced off the top and before the safety Nazis come after me I was very 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 careful and I know what I'm doing well almost all the time anyway uh, the battery was completely dried out but anyway I still filled it with a carb um, bicarbonate of soda solution just to neutralize any leftover acid and um, I did take precautions when dumping that as well and yes I do know how to take precautions <laughs> I even think I wore gloves, maybe. Possibly safety goggles. No, no, no safety goggles. <laughs> I'm a man. And have the scars to prove it. But anyway, I wouldn't recommend you start slicing open lead acid batteries. It's a stupid idea. So, essentially, I sliced it open. And no, this is not the inside of a lead acid battery. Uh, there were separator plates made of plastic. Came across each one of these to separate the individual cells. So I chiseled those out and... Uh, put some padding in. Uh, recycled of course because well I'm green. <laughs> Duct tape. Now the idea is that I can simply pop this little sucker in there and it's got a nice vibration dampened box to live in so that hopefully it won't get damaged if I do manage to use it on my bike. And but if you're asking, it's not exactly a Harley Davidson, but that'll be for another video. This is the top of the battery. 
you can see I, I took off the little vent cap things uh, just to flood it up but it was completely dry anyway the lead's quite safe planning on melting it down for I don't know if I fished I'd maybe make fishing weights but I don't fish uh, and I don't reload bullets because I don't have a gun but uh no I'll figure out something for the lead eh? it's always good stuff to have now these things are not normal battery bits this is a 33 ohm power resistor, a wire wound, uh, I think it's made in the UK, probably the only thing that's made in the UK that I own. <laughs> but anyway, it limits, uh, it's it's there basically to limit the charge current to just under half an amp. And I know that's dreadfully low for something like super capacitors, which you could charge at possibly 200 amps or basically as many amps as you could stuff in there. But uh, my power supply is quite limited, so uh, it'll stick at half an amp. It takes about two hours to charge from zero. The charging curve is very different from a battery, I'd say. Uh, essentially, supercapacitors, you can discharge them to zero volts. If you did that to a lead-acid battery, it would be a block of lead and maybe acid. Or it'd just be a big fire. But, uh, so basically, it charges up very fast. It charges up in a in a curve basically uh, it charges up very fast at the beginning but the higher the voltage gets the slower it charges so it takes about two hours if you wanted to charge it up to its full 16 volts but for the purpose of this I'm only going to charge it up to I believe 14 volts maybe 14 and a half and before anybody goes overboard Cars and bikes and basically anything that has a lead acid battery, all the circuitry is rated to about 15 volts. Actually, I looked at the service manual of my bike and it says that the computer will shut down if the voltage goes above 20 volts and will re-engage if the voltage drops below 18 volts. So, uh, internal electronics wouldn't be affected because, well, basically they're rated to that voltage, which is the voltage at which it charges. Now the reason I don't want to stick it at 12 volts is simply because you get more energy out of the supercapacitor pack if you charge it up to 14 volts instead of pretty much 13 volts if it was a car, if it was a lead acid battery. So you get a, a few extra amps of en well, watts of energy basically. And the alternator, there wouldn't be any problem even starting it I guess up to maybe 15 volts. I have read some literature on the internet that a company actually uh, combined a supercapacitor pack with a normal lead acid battery for stop start applications and they ran it at 14 volts and there were no problems. So uh, I, there shouldn't be any problems. Now, what are the challenges that would possibly be faced by using one of these? And to be honest, there is one. Well, there, there actually, there is a few. What could happen is, uh, this simply doesn't have the juice to start a motorbike, but I'm presuming it should have. Uh, I read up the numbers and the bike, at an absolute worst before you have to take the engine apart to see what's wrong, should crank with 180 amps. This capacitor pack should be good for 200 amps for one second without sustaining any damage. That shouldn't be repeated indefinitely, but for uh, starting a bike occasionally it wouldn't be any problem. Now the second problem, and this one's potentially more serious, is that when these are discharged to a reasonably low voltage, let's say they're charged to 14 volts, you crank the bike and it drops down to, I don't know, potentially 9 volts, I'm not saying it would, it probably won't drop that low. But the current draw from this could be greater than the current draw that can be supplied by the voltage regulation circuitry. Now, from the reading of the service manual, the voltage regulator has a fuse rated to 25 amp, no, 30 amps. And I'm presuming that if I exceed that, the fuse will just blow and uh, everything will be fine. No damage done and I can figure out another system. But honestly, I doubt it'll happen. If the voltage doesn't drop low enough, the, the alternator and voltage regulation circuitry should be able to provide 30 amps which should charge us right up and uh, it should be fine. However, I will take a few precautions when I do try to start my bike with it because, uh, well, I don't want to break it, poor thing. 
So basically that's my video for today and uh, thanks for watching.